Okay, so how did this adventure come about? It all started when the neighborhood I live in, in South Africa, decided for security purposes that we wanted to be able to close our neighborhood. So our um, local administration does allow neighborhoods to, uh, to apply to close the area, uh, you know, to close streets off with uh, security gates and so on, um, to try and prevent crime in the area. Um, and so what we decided to do, we wanted to do, was to put automated gates at two entrances, block off two others um, with permanent gates, and then we'd have a boom gate for, for visitors. But we also wanted to allow residents to use those two automated gates um, as, they, as they needed to. And also we had a requirement that those gates be opened at particular times of the day to allow traffic to pass through uh, during peak hours. So this talk is going to cover a few aspects of the journey, um, why we closed, why we chose key lock, what key lock actually is and what it implies, um, and how it works, as well as my experience in obtaining full access to both the receiver and the transmitters. Um, and while it does focus on a particular manufacturer, um, I won't be revealing the manufacturer key, um, primarily because we're still using these remotes in our closure. You know, we've got a, a reasonable sized investment in them. Um, and of course, there are probably hundreds of thousands of other people who are also using these same um, transmitters and receivers. And the manufacturer, when I informed them about um, you know, my ability to recover this key, basically said, we don't have a plan. We've got no, no plan to replace them, uh, to recall them, or anything like, like that. It would just be simply too expensive. Um, and we've got no kind of you know, upgrade procedures or anything like that that we have in place. So uh, unfortunately, I won't be sharing the key. But um, it's probably easy enough for anybody to follow what I've done, um, given the sort of breadcrumbs I'll be laying down. Okay, so we wanted to have something that was better than your average gate opener, and especially considering that this, uh, this adventure started uh, around 2008, 2009 timeframe, um, when the time of rolling codes wasn't actually all that common. So we wanted to have better than, uh, than those average gate openers because of part, uh, smart people like uh, Andrew Mohawk, or Andrew Nohawk as he is now, um, who demonstrated back in two, uh, 2012 um, how to snoop and replay um, fixed code remotes. So he managed to decode the bit pattern transmitted and replay those using a cheap transmitter. Um, and I'm confusing up my dates here. Uh, obviously, we started this journey in 2009. Uh, as a security person, I was already aware of the possibilities. Uh, Andrew obviously demonstrated this a little bit later. Um, and so if you are able to, uh, to replay a transmitter code, um, then obviously all the security of your closure starts to go out the window. Um, and you know, it wouldn't be a, um, a great setup for a community of 150 households to have to go out and buy new transmitters and new receivers. Uh, and so right off the bat, we wanted to make sure um, that we would have something a bit better than that. The other thing um, is that we I had previous, previously lived in a smaller uh, community of townhouses and was very familiar with the sort of flag days when you know, if a remote got stolen, you wanted to change the code and all of the residents had to come to the gate all at once to change to the new value so that you could cycle uh, cycle those codes. And so when you've got 150 households with you know, two or three remotes each, that becomes a, a massive undertaking to coordinate. So Centurion gate motors are pretty much the gold standard um, in South Africa. Um, I'm not aware of anybody else that has anything near to the market penetration. Um, we ended up choosing the, the D5 Evo, which is you know, a really sophisticated controller. Um, 
It's got things like time of day settings to open and close the gates at particular times, um, which is perfect for our access control permit, um, where we had to open it to allow uh, peak traffic to pass. And it also has a built-in receiver for remotes, which make use of the key lock system. Um, sounds perfect, um, except it was only capable of learning up to 500 remotes, um, 500 buttons, sorry. Um, and of course, each transmitter can have up to uh, four buttons. Uh, and while it may have been feasible to manage the remotes for 150, ho uh, 150 households, uh, and it would get really tight if uh, we had to deal with more than, than two per household, uh, it wouldn't have been possible to coordinate those remotes enrollment between the two different gates that we needed to, that we wanted to manage. And so we ended up with a receiver from a company called Sherlotronics. Um, they're a complex receiver. This is a device that can accommodate up to 8,000 enrolled uh, transmitters split across two relays, which is perfect because uh, at some, at one end of the, the road, we had two gates, you know, opening and closing in, in uh, opposite directions. So then the matter of actually managing those transmitters um, arose. Since we had two gates, we wanted to synchronize them and have a backup, um, obviously, in case uh, of lightning damage or any other uh, reason. So Sherlotronics provides an application that allows you to interface directly with the receiver over a USB port um, and enroll remotes into that application directly. Unfortunately, the app was terrible. Uh, and so I... It was because it was a .NET app, decompile it and try and figure out exactly how it's communicating with the remote, look at the format of the values that it's receiving and storing and try and figure out which parts are important and which parts are less important and, you know, figure out things like um, cyclic redundancy checks and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so I re-implemented their application using, uh, using Java because that's what I knew at the time. Um, and was able to enroll 400 or 500 remotes uh, fairly easily uh, at the time. Okay, so, so what is Keylock actually? Um, Keylock was founded on, was founded by um, some South Africans, actually, uh, a company called Nanotech back in the late 80s. So it's definitely been around for a long time. Uh, I think it was sort of revolutionary back in the day to use these um, these rolling codes. Um, but their principles were basically uh, secure remote control systems can only be implemented if two conditions are met. A large number of possible combinations must be available, and the system may never respond twice to the same transmitted code. Uh, and that obviously prevents replay attacks uh, from being effective. And so the first requirement is achieved by transmitting a 66-bit code word. Um, so there's that large number of possible combinations. Um, and then the second requirement is achieved by including a 16-bit incrementing counter that, the, uh, that is synchronized between the transmitter and the receiver. And so if the receiver um, receives a transmission with the same code word or a previous code word, uh, then it knows that it should ignore those um, those transmissions. Um, but hold on, you may be thinking that if the if it's just a simple counter, you know, once the um, the eavesdropper looks at the transmission that they've captured, they could simply increment the counter. So this approach or this attack is foiled by encrypting the counter and some other data. Um, using a key shared between the receiver and the transmitter. And so uh, you end up with a 32-bit value, which is encrypted and essentially or effectively random, um, that prevents those kinds of attacks. So it's not uh, technically a 66-bit key space anymore. 34 of those bits are, um, are readable and, uh, and predictable. But the remaining 32 bits 
are sufficient to prevent brute force attacks, considering that it is an encrypted value. Um, and so you've got a 4 billion number key space at one second per day. You're looking at you know, thousands of days to successfully de- um, send one value. Um, and then you know, you'd have to start completely from scratch to, to send the next value if you wanted to repeat that. One of the, the key um, usability requirements um, that, uh, that comes out of having this rolling code is that there needs to be the ability to resynchronize the counters. So if the transmitter is operated out of range of the receiver, for example, you know, your kid's playing with it uh, inside the house and the receiver's hundreds of meters away, um, you know, what happens? So the principle that Keylock operates under is that there is a blocked 32K val- um, window. So the 32,768 values behind your, your current uh, recorded value in the receiver is considered to be blocked. Um, considering this is a 16-bit number, that's sort of half of the window. Uh, there's an open window uh, of 16 values ahead. So if you have pressed the um, transmitter button less than 16 times, uh, the next time that you press the button within range of the receiver, it will immediately accept it and, uh, and operate. But if you are up to 32,000 values ahead of the, re- the recorded value in the receiver, if you press the button twice and the receiver receives two consecutive values, it will immediately resynchronize. So if you, you, know, you press the button and it doesn't work, your immediate reaction is just to press it again, and that's how it, um, it resynchronizes. So that's quite a, a clever approach. And we'll revisit this in a minute. Okay, so the format of the transmission over the air, uh, it's using amplitude shift keying, on-off keying, and um, there is the principle, the concept of uh, an elemental time period. And if your bit is less than two, or well, is in the order of, sorry, if your high signal is uh, two elemental periods high and one elemental period low, that's considered to be a zero. And if it is one elemental period high and two elemental periods low, then it's considered to be a one. <clears throat> so over the air, your, um, your transmission has a, a preamble, a blank space for the header, 66 bits of, um, of transmission, of which 32 bits are encrypted and 34 bits are clear text, and then there's a guard time to signal the end of that transmission. <clears throat> and so you can um, break that down. Uh, the encrypted portion is um, the, the <clears throat> within the encrypted portion is that 16-bit counter. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, some discrimination bits which allow you to verify that you've decrypted this correctly. Um, those discrimination bits are 10 bits of the serial number of the transmitter, um, and then there are some uh, some additional bits that represent the buttons. So four buttons, um, which can ultimately end up signaling up to 15 values. So if you hold down the buttons in combination, well, I guess it's 14 values um, technically, and I'll, I can explain how that comes out. Um, and then you've got the, the serial number transmitted in clear text, uh, the buttons again repeated, and then two flags for a repeating transmission. So you've the first uh, submission or the first transmission would not have that, but if you hold the button down, it will repeat the transmission um, until you release that. And then there's a voltage low signal, which can give you a heads up to change the battery of your transmitter. Okay, so <clears throat> the counter is encrypted using a shared symmetric key um, known by both the transmitter and the receiver. So the question arises, how is this key derived? Um, how is it shared between the receiver and the transmitter? So the keylock documentation actually leaves the, uh, the key derivation function um, 
up to the implementer. Although there is a reference implementation that uh, appears to be used in practice. There are two forms of learning or enrollment for a keylock remote, a normal learn and secure learn. So in the normal learn process, the key is derived from a combination of a 64-bit manufacturer key, which obviously should be uh, protected um, you know, very, very carefully, and the unique 28-bit uh, serial number of the transmitter. And that is used as an input into the manufacturer chosen key derivation function. So that same function is used in the receiver to derive uh, a key when you go through the learning process. So you would typically press a button on the receiver, press the button on the transmitter twice to confirm the, um, the transmitter, and then the receiver will derive that key and store it with the record of the button and which relay it should operate, etc. Okay, but by implication, what this means is that the receiver must contain a copy of that manufacturer key, which is the crown jewels, essentially, of that manufacturer's transmitter-receiver ecosystem. Um, any transmitters that are programmed with that key or with a key derivation, fun well, with a key derived from that manufacturer key can be considered compatible. So you can enroll transmitters onto any receiver that has that same key, which is a nice feature. Uh, it means that as a, as a user, you don't have to go through any kind of uh, key management issues, so that 99% of the population are not going to care about. Um, the unfortunate part is that they don't actually give you the option uh, <laughs> to, to set up your own keys. So uh, this is ultimately one of the outcomes of the research that I've been able to do, is that you can set up your own ecosystem with your own manufacturer key um, and prevent enrollment of you know, non- non-compatible remotes. So the problem with the normal learn process is that one of the inputs into the key derivation function is exposed every time that you um, press the button. It sends that, um, that serial number. And so the, the key, obviously, uh, is derived from that. So if you know what the manufacturer key is and you're observing a transmission that contains the serial number, you can immediately derive the key and you can make your own transmissions. And so um, the, there is an alternative um, enrollment process called the secure learn, um, but that needs to be set up from the beginning. So the, the transmitter needs to be programmed as a secure learn transmitter and the receiver needs to be set up as a secure learn transceiver as well, a receiver as well. Um, and the way that works is that a key, the, the key derivation function uh, does not necessarily depend on the, uh, the serial number anymore. The manufacturer can choose a different value. Maybe it's the serial number plus 10 or, you know, whatever. Um, and that value is then transmitted using a special combination of buttons. Typically, you're going to press all four buttons on the, on the transmitter. That transmits the key, uh, well, a, a seed, sorry, uh, to the receiver. The receiver then passes that seed through the key deri derivation function um, and associates it with the transmitter serial number. So it's not derived specifically from the serial number, it's simply associated with it. Uh, and as a result, next time the, the, the serial number is transmitted, the receiver can look up the appropriate seed and, uh, and uh, come up with that, uh, with that algorithm, with the shared key. 99.9%, um, I think, do not use this um, the system. It may be more in use in, in cars, than in residential systems. So just to mention that, uh, that key lock has been used 
um, in a number of manufacturer, uh, vehicle manufacturers, uh, Toyota, Jaguar. I think Tesla was using Keylock at some point. I know they've moved on to, to Bluetooth um, currently. Um, right, okay, so that's the key derivation function. So in the normal learn process, the manufacturer knows that key derivation function uh, and the manufacturer key, obviously. The transmitter contains a shared key, which is derived using that uh, key derivation function and the serial number of that individual transmitter. And so the, the transmitter sends its serial number and that encrypted counter and the other values as well. The receiver contains that key derivation function as well and the manufacturer key. It receives the serial number, derives the shared key, and decrypts the counter and checks it against the stored value um, and decides whether to open the, the relay or not. So this is the, uh, the standard, or this sort of uh, reference um, key gen uh, implementation. Um, I receive a 32-bit uh, serial number, which is actually only 28 bits, so we mask out the top, um, top four bits. Um, decrypt the serial number masked with uh, a six in, that, in those high four bits. Um, using the manufacturer key, um, uh, or that with the serial number again decrypted with a two in the in the high those high bits, and then that is how you derive that original sixty four uh, that sixty four bit key. So it's kind of the, the value repeated twice. Um, although the you know it ends up with two very different thirty uh, two bit values. Um, because the, the decryption is mutated by the, the six and the two uh, in those bits. Okay, so attacks that have been tried against uh, the Keylock system, um, dating back to 2007, 2008 timeframes, um, cryptanalysis of the nonlinear feedback shift register uh, and the, the crypto algorithms. Uh, reduced the effort to brute force a single key um, down to approximately two weeks of FPA or just uh, FPGA assisted calculations. Um, so that would allow you to eavesdrop on a on a single transmission uh, and derive the um, the individual key for that particular transmitter would allow you to derive um, that key, and so you could then. Uh, transmit a, uh, a second instance or um, you know, increment the counter to an appropriate value. Um, you know, that doesn't buy you a heck of a lot. That only compromises a single device, uh, and that's quite a lot of work to put in. Um, side channel attacks uh, are a completely different beast. Uh, that allows you to, well, the process of a side channel attack allows you to do things like monitoring the power consumption of the IC or of the receiver while it's operating, uh, and particularly while it's doing the cryptographic operations. Um, and by using very se uh, sensitive power monitoring tools, you can actually determine, uh, possibly statistically, what crypto algorithms are being performed based on the, uh, you know, on, on the values that the cryptographic algorithms are computing based on how much power is actually consumed at a particular time. So that's uh, some pretty serious rocket scientists, a uh, little bit above my level. Um, but ultimately, if you are targeting the transmitter, you can get, again, w only one key. If you manage to do that on a receiver, you could ret uh, retrieve the manufacturer key uh, and ultimately crack the, uh, the entire ecosystem. And then replay attacks um, work by jamming one transmission while recording it, and that prevents the receiver from actually operating on that. And then what you do is jam and record a second transmission while replaying the first one. So you know if it doesn't work the first, if the transmission doesn't work the first time, you're going to press the button again. If you record the first transmission and replay it when the second one is being 
pressed, you can keep that second transmission for yourself. And that means that you have an opportunity to use that at a time of your choosing. For example, once the person has walked away from their car, you can press the button, unlock the car, and uh, potentially drive off with it. Um, it's not going to allow you to unlock it a second time or unlock it um, you know, any time in the future, but that does at least give you the opportunity to, to enter um, the car. But you do lose out if the, um, if the person you know, presses the button a third time, if you're not intercepting and replaying, if you're not prepared to, to intercept and replay your, your previous counter. As soon as a legitimate transmission increments the counter, uh, you've lost out on the opportunity to use that recorded one. So this was demonstrated by Sammy Kamkar back in 2015. <laughs> A decent attack, um, but not terribly practical. Recently, um, in two th like May, I think, um, the rollback attack was demonstrated where um, they, th they show that you can unlock your, your car with simply capturing, by simply capturing two, tr two consecutive transmissions. And if that sounds vaguely familiar, uh, it should, because it made me think immediately of the key lock window that we talked about, um, where if you have two transmissions within this resync 32K window, that you can immediately resynchronize the, uh, the transmitter with the receiver. But there's that block 32K window that you're supposed to check that the transmissions are not within that window first. And I'm not saying that these manufacturers are using Keylock, but it seems to me like the implementation of the receiver simply omitted one single if statement, that if the transmissions are less than the current counter, then ignore those transmissions. And so if you capture two historical transmissions from a transmitter, you could simply resynchronize and and use that second transmission to open or operate the receiver. So that made me that made me laugh and uh, face palm quite hard. Okay, so apart from rollback and roll jam, um, there are two main ways that a, that a key lock system can fail if the manufacturer key is compromised. Um, and so you can create forged transmitters, uh, which can gain access to whatever it is that is uh, controlled by the key lock receiver, or a forged transmitter can deny access. And the way it can deny access is simply by incrementing the counter beyond where the legitimate um, transmitter can re-enroll itself or resynchronize itself. So if you jump uh, a number of transmissions into the future, um, into that 32K, 32K blocked window, you're going to have to press your transmitter 32,000 times in order to get back into synchronization. Uh, and so that's uh, unlikely to happen. Um, when that happens, you're probably just going to uh, decide that that transmitter is broken, and try and re-enroll it, but you'd have to go through that whole process first. So ultimately, um, how can we get hold of that manufacturer key? So I wasn't in a position to try and do uh, power analysis, and that was you know, um, sort of beyond my level of, of curiosity, shall we say, uh, besides which it had already been... Uh, pretty thoroughly demonstrated um, years before. Well, one year I was at, uh, at DEF CON, and I bought a, uh, a thing called a Black Magic Probe, which is an open source JTAG uh, and single wire debug debugger. Uh, and what that gives you is the ability to access the debug ports on, uh, on microprocessors and a bunch of others. 
Um, so when I got home, I was like, yeah, okay, you know, I've got this uh, JTAG adapter. What am I going to do with it? Um, and I've got a whole bunch of dev boards at home, um, but all of them had firmware on them that I'd already programmed uh, myself. Uh, so that wasn't much of an adventure trying to pull it off again. Uh, and then I remembered that I had this uh, this complex receiver, uh, two of which were obviously in the, the gates, uh, but I had another one that I used for enrolling new remotes um, as needed. And this is based on an STM32 F103 uh, ARM microprocessor, um, which is the same as you would find in a you know, cheap blue pill dev board. Um, and I thought this was a, would be a great opportunity for me to learn about you know, some lower level hardware and, and reverse engineering firmware and that sort of thing. Um, and especially since I hadn't done anything like that before. So I carefully matched the pins on the debug header of the, um, the Sherlotronics board, which they, they had for programming it in the, in the factory. And you know, between that and the microcontroller, and you sort of figure out which pin is connected to which, um, and figure out which is the uh, TDI and the TDO and the, the various pins. And I hooked up my Blackmagic probe, and I pulled off the firmware. Uh, and this was a complete um, you know, mind-blown situation for me, because I was expecting it to fail. Uh, if you think about it, the firmware on this microcontroller must contain the manufacturer key. And if you can just pull it off, then that manufacturer key is now you know, within reach uh, with very little effort so far. Um, so, I mean, this was a, a huge anticlimax. I was uh, completely expecting to be uh, denied um, because you know, they should have enabled code readout protection. Uh, and then have to try various things like glitching to try and uh, and bypass that. But not but all just sort of fell into my lap on the first opportunity, which was anticlimactic to be sure. Okay, so now I've got this firmware image. It's a 128k blob. Um, you know, how, how can I make sense of it? Um, so the first thing I did was uh, look for uh, you know, decompilers and uh, reverse engineering tools. And uh, I settled on Ghidra, which had been uh, released by the, the NSA. I'm not saying that I trust them, but uh, <laughs> um, I decided to use it anyway. Um, and that has built-in support for decompiling and reverse engineering bare metal ARM binaries. So this was quite a learning curve for me. I hadn't done any uh, reverse engineering at a machine code level before. You know, I've de um, decompiled Java classes and .NET classes and that sort of thing, um, but that's a very diff different kettle of fish. Um, <clears throat> one of the tools that I found very useful was uh, something called SVD Loader. An SVD file is a description of the hardware uh, at a register level. Uh, and so what that means is it associates you know, registers by number with an actual description of what that register does and what it means in the particular context of that microcontroller. Um, and so what that means is that when you decompile the binary, uh, instead of looking at a number like you know, DAT 5000014, uh, you can actually see something a bit more intelligent, like um, you know, references to uh, you know, the system status register or, or something along those lines. And so that really makes it a lot easier to understand what, uh, what's actually happening. And while that didn't, didn't end up leading me to, uh, to the manufacturer key, uh, to the relevant functions, it did make you know, that initial understanding of what I was looking at um, a lot easier. Um, you know, if you're in a completely foreign land, uh, it does help to have some road signs um, to make it a little bit more comfortable. Okay, so the next approach that I took was to try and um, find a string which is displayed when you're going through the enrollment process. So it says something like, you know, Press the button, you know, press the first button on the transmitter to enroll. So I looked for the string press and I managed to find it. Um, 
And then I was going to look for you know, references to that. And I went down a, a whole rabbit hole. And it turns out that what I was looking at was actually display-related code uh, and not the code that received the transmission or the code that was trying to, to decrypt um, those secret values. So that didn't take me to, uh, to the crypto code either. Then I found a blog by a guy named David Lodge, which was very, very helpful. And this ended up taking me to, um, to those, uh, to that manufacturer key. Although I did go down some unproductive rabbit holes as well, uh, initially. So the tips are basically to always look for strings and constants. So I tried the strings approach. Um, I then started trying to look for uh, for constants that appear in the uh, the crypto algorithm. Now the crypto algorithm that that Keylock uses, while not being you know, published, it's under non disclosure agreement. Um, there are implementations of it out on the internet. Uh, you know, some people have uh, leaked. The, the data sheets, uh, and other people have re-implemented it their own way. And so when I was looking at, uh, at Keylock, uh, I, avenged, I f- initially found the, um, the sort of re-implemented versions. Um, and so I was looking for constants that appeared in that re-implemented version. And was completely unsuccessful. Um, the, it turns out that the re-implemented version was more efficient than the original manufacturer's code, uh, or, you know, simpler conceptually. And so the constants that they used, they had like, you know, f- uh, 528 as a, as a constant, for example. Uh, and it turns out that it was like 20 times 19 or whatever, uh, 219 or something along, along those lines, um, that was actually split up into two constants in the manufacturer's original algorithm. And so, um, while I was unable to find, you know, uh, 528, when I started looking for the constants in the original algorithm, um, I did find those pretty quickly. Uh, it took me almost immediately to the, uh, to the crypto key which was uh, uh, quite satisfying, I have to say. Um, so yeah, so look for those strings and constants, um, make guesses about the original source, uh, and if you can find the original source, whether it's uh, you know, a leaked data sheet or a, a, you know, a re-implementation of it, that, uh, that may help you. Uh, if you can, find a function that you recognize and then work backwards to identify other functions. So this function calls that function. I've identified this function, so the function that's calling it must be um, you know, that, etc. cetera. Um, and it helps if they use open source code so that you can crib from it. Um, open source or at least um, you know, source code that you can find. Okay, so um, my first approach was to uh, put a logic analyzer on the radio chip um, that is part of the of the dev board, well, of the receiver board, um, and I wanted to to implement the decoder on a PC, uh, which is obviously a much friendlier environment to develop in than a uh, an embedded device where you're going through compile cycles and you don't actually have any. Um, like good output mechanisms. And so I used uh, the Sigrock project. Uh, this is PulseView um, and a cheap you know, $10 logic analyzer. Um, and I implemented the Keylock decoder as a PulseView or Sigrock uh, plugin. So after much um, trial and error, I was eventually able to, to isolate the actual you know, transmission uh, bits that you can see. Um, part of the problem is that when you're monitoring the radio, there's a, a whole lot of ambient noise that is picked up at the same time. So it's not a nice, clean signal. There's you know, tons of you know, ups and downs surrounding it. Obviously, the transmitter ends up being a stronger signal but um, 
you know, actually discriminating noise from the legitimate signal when all you're getting is ones and zeros ends up being a little bit tricky. And so what I ended up doing was I used a, a basically an external switch to trigger the transmitter, and I used the logic analyzer on that switch to show when that switch went high and then when it went low, which actually pointed me to the exact time frame that the the radio chip in the transmitter was was active, and that allowed me to narrow it down and then work on you know decoding that using my my Python code. Um, and this uh, will be open source. Um, I haven't quite got it cleaned up as nicely as I would like, um, but it will be submitted to the uh, to the Sigrock project. Uh, and that includes the, the encryption and decryption um, code, so you can actually, f if you know what the manufacturer key is, you can fill that in and it'll show you what the, uh, the decrypted value is and the, the effectively the, the counter and the discriminatory bits and so on. So once you, you know, line those two up, you can actually see the, the similarities and it's, it's quite, quite reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so once I figured out how to decode it and I was comfortable enough that I had the algorithms right and the manufacturer key right, um, then comes a, a choice of you know, what sort of firmware am I going to build. So I ran into a project called ESP Home, which is uh, an Arduino-based Internet of Things development environment that makes it easy for you to build um, smart devices and connected to um, to the internet, essentially. It's designed for the ESP8266 and ESP32 processors, um, which have got Wi-Fi built in. Um, and those are a very different beast to the ARM STM32 processor that's actually in the receiver of this complex, uh, it, making up the, the complex receiver board. Um, so fortunately, there is an Arduino implementation for the STM32 processor, and what I decided to do was port ESP Home from the ESP8266 to the STM32. Um, and it was eh, not, not the most complex of, uh, of processes, which is uh, very fortunate because I am uh, what I consider to be a cargo cult C or C++ programmer. You know, I copy what I see other people doing and if it doesn't work, then I, uh, you know, the gods must be angry with me. Um, yeah. So while Keylock was not uh, amongst the, sorry. Um, so ESP Home already had support for uh, decoding transmitters and uh, receivers. So they they had support for uh, decoding infrared transmissions from like you know, regular remote controls and that sort of thing. Um, and while there was no keylock implementation, it was a pretty simple uh, matter to to implement that using the framework that they already had. So um, the ESP Home project provided uh, a huge amount of infrastructure and saved me from having to implement that all myself. So that was uh, very helpful. Um, so there's a, you know, a few hundred lines of code um, making up a diff to the ESP Home project. Um, that I have in a, in a repository. Uh, it hasn't been accepted, but uh, I'm going to be um, you know, forward porting it uh, to their, their latest efforts. They've actually uh, expanded their, um, their support for additional platforms. They've now got um, support for a bunch of, of, uh, of additional platforms, including the, uh, the TUIA um, microprocessors, which is quite neat. Okay, um, so then uh, I implemented the Keylock uh, crypto algorithms um, as well as the, the decoders for the, for the Keylock protocol. Um, so that ended up being just a you know, couple of hundred lines of code um, for, the, for the decoder. Uh, you know, less than 150 lines of code for the decryption. And then this is an interesting part uh, it's based on code that I found on GitHub uh, that 
omitted uh, some of the key details, like how to actually derive the key that you program into the transmitter. But the HCS301 is a common IC that is made by Microchip, which now owns uh, the Keylock um, patent or whatever, that bought Keylock. Um, and you know, it's a common chip that you'll find in transmitters. So what this now allows you to do is you can program your own keys and uh, serial numbers into a transmitter that uses the HDS301 chip or is compatible with the programming uh, mechanism, which is quite neat. So ultimately what this gives you is the ability to create your own ecosystem of transmitters and receivers. Okay, so we have a quick sort of uh, demonstration. We're connected over a, uh, a USB serial port to the um, to the complex receiver, and when you press the transmitter buttons, uh, you can see the the serial number as well as the sequence number which is being uh, received. So 4BA, 4BB, 4BC, 4BD as you press the button uh, again and again. So, you know, achievements unlocked. I was uh, very chuffed with myself. But my ultimate objective was to integrate this into a sort of home automation platform. Um, partially because Microchip has got a patent on remote keyless entry, um, but they've got nothing on uh, home automation. So I figured I was being clever by avoiding that. Uh, so in order to bring it online... Um, I wanted to to move away from having a PC uh, listening to this serial port and then trying to parse the uh, the receiver data out of it. Um, so that brought me back to the ESP32 dev board that I had lying around, um, which is where the ESP Home project originally started. So what I thought that I would do um, the uh, the receiver board had a display uh, mounted uh, using that uh, that double row header, and that double row header included pins for 5 volts and uh, uh, a bunch of other things, but uh, amongst that were two pins which were connected to the serial port, well, a serial port on the STM32. Um, and so what I figured was I would connect the ESP32 and the STM32 using that serial port and allow them to communicate with each other, uh, the STM32 would then report any um, transmissions received to the ESP32, and the ESP32 would push those out over Wi-Fi to, uh, to Home Assistant. Um, and um, and that, that worked pretty well. Uh, the remaining question then was what sort of communications protocol do I use over the serial port? Um, should I create something of my own? Um, or is there something that I can work from already? So the um, ESP Home Project did have a, a sort of extender protocol designed for communicating with uh, little Arduino microprocessors, like the STM, uh, not the STM, sorry, the, uh, the Atmel 328s uh, and that sort of thing. Um, but it was very limited. It didn't include uh, support. You know, it was basically just for binary switches uh, and possibly some analog things, um, and I didn't think that that was a great choice to use. But ESP Home already uh, also had an implementation of an API that allows Home Assistant to interrogate um, your microprocessor over Wi-Fi, um, so it can query things like text and analog and switches and send and receive instructions and that sort of thing. And so what I thought would be a, a good approach would be to implement the same API over the serial port. So all I needed to do then was implement a client for that API over the serial port, and I could pass through effectively all of those endpoints. So the receiver actually has a bunch of switches and uh, you know kind of toggle the relays, um, press buttons and that sort of thing. So um, I figured it would be a good thing to be able to to expose those uh, over the Wi-Fi as well. Uh, and so um, 
a few hundred, well, 2,000 lines of code later, um, I had an implementation of a client to the API um, that could operate and uh, communicate between that uh, STM32 and the ESP32 uh, to share those, um, those values. And this then allows you to, um, to treat a, a remote receiver similarly to uh, an NFC tag, which uh, um, Home Assistant already had support for. Uh, and so you can see that it's receiving a transmission, and then once a Home Assistant has that transmission, you can you know, trigger all sorts of actions based on that, turning lights on, uh, opening gates, um, whatever you decide that you want to do with that. Um, and this was ultimately where I wanted to go with this. Um, <clears throat> so then I mentioned, um, okay, so the way you configure uh, ESP Home uh, using YAML, um, so you define the pins that the radio is connected to, um, and then you've got things like uh, a lambda, which is your own code, which can run when triggered. Uh, and so when you receive a transmission, if you are able to decrypt it successfully, then uh, format it into a buffer, and we're going to send that buffer um, by publishing the new state to any listeners. Um, and listeners are things like the API um, or anything else that is registered an in interest in this particular entity. Um, and if you aren't able to decrypt it, then you, you can print it out, but in a slightly different format so that whoever is receiving that can know that somebody's trying to do something dodgy. Um, but I was unable to, to decrypt that value successfully. Um, and that's actually kind of interesting because um, I don't think any of the sort of mass market receivers ever tell you that you know we've picked up a transmission that we were unable to decrypt. You know, it made sense we could parse it. You know, it seems legit. Uh, in, in that respect, uh, it's not just noise that we've uh, tried to decode, um, but this looks like a replay attack. So, you know, you don't get those alerts from a, from a mass market uh, receiver. Um, and then this is uh, an example of um, setting up programming of the transmitter. So the same ESP Home instance that is reporting the... Um, you know, the, the transmissions that have been received can actually be programmed to code the serial number into a new transmitter, which is actually kind of neat. So you could actually sit outside, um, you know, our gates, wait for somebody to press the button, decode it, figure out what the current sequence number is for that particular transmitter, program a new transmitter that will transmit the next sequence number. And so you can uh, simply you know, press the button on that transmitter and operate the gate um, immediately. So that's, um, as you can imagine, quite a, a flaw ultimately in um, you know, if you are able to recover that manufacturer key. Um, so outstanding features, um, persistent recording of counters and replay uh, detection. Uh, so actually saying that, hey, you know, this was a replay. Um, the API, the client API that I've implemented um, doesn't handle desynchronization particularly well. Um, and then there are some implementation details with regards to different kinds of, of entities in the client API that I still need to work on. Um, and there is one strangeness with that uh, HCS301 uh, initial sequence number. When you're programming it, uh, you should be able to specify at what sequence number it should start. Um, this seems erratic to me. I haven't been able to actually get it to, to transmit the sequence number that I tell it to start at. Uh, it ends up being some kind of weird random value. I haven't actually figured out that part uh, 100% uh, at this point. 
But the code is available on GitHub. Um, there are three branches, the STM32 port, the API client port, and the, uh, the key lock uh, implementation. Um, and thank you very much for, for listening uh, to my story. Uh, if there are any questions... Thank you. Um, we do have a question. Mr. Doss, I'm new to rolling hopping code mechanisms. Why do keylog and similar protocols not use timestamps to prevent replay attacks? Okay, so uh, there's a couple of complications that come up when you start talking about uh, timestamps. The, the first of them is that it is expensive to, to actually keep time. Uh, you know, you, you need a fairly accurate crystal. Um, you know, you have to provide power to the system that is maintaining the time. Um, so it ends up draining the battery more, uh, than if you simply turn off until a button is pressed. Um, you've also got issues in terms of maintaining accurate time. So if you need to, um, you, know, you, you may need to deal with uh, temperature compensation. So uh, a clock's speed up or slow down depending on the temperature, uh, the ambient temperature. Um, and as a result, it can be um, you know, kind of difficult to make sure that you maintain that precise time synchronization. More recent versions of the Keylock algorithm do do time sync. Uh, I think uh, things like the DS32 something or other um, timekeeping chip have made that a lot easier um, and not quite as, as onerous, but keeping in mind that the system was designed in you know, the late 80s where these sorts of chips were not available. Um, now you, know, you can point to them and say, hey, you know, it would be easy to do. Uh, yes, now, now it is a lot easier to do. All right, thank you. And another one. I missed the part on why did you have to port ESP Home to STM32? Wouldn't it be possible to implement Keylog Transmitter in ESP32 directly, which, as far as I understand, already supports some 433 megahertz transceivers? Yes. So um, the problem um, that faced me was that the receiver that I had wasn't using 433 megahertz. It's using uh, 403.92 as their uh, carrier frequency. And this is a licensed frequency in South Africa. And so you don't actually find general purpose receivers and transmitters on that particular frequency. Um, and so I needed to make do with the hardware that I had access to that the manufacturer had built. Uh, and that was using an STM32. Uh, yes. Um, much like I was tapping the, the line between the radio and the STM32 um, with my logic analyzer, I could have tapped that line and you know, routed that directly to the ESP32. Um, I actually implemented that while I was testing um, some things uh, in the, you know, the last few days. So yes, you can do it on the, um, the ESP32 as well. But you know, I had a board that was wired up um, using an STM32 and the radio itself all on one piece of hardware. So that's why I chose to port it uh, to the STM32. All right. Thank you. Um, I guess um, is the person who asked this question here. We have a gift for you, a cool HITB hat. There you go. Swallow mirror. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, let's give uh, the speaker a round of applause again. Thank you.